Hello, and welcome to Fisher Investments Market Update Webinar. My name is Jessica Smith, and I'm a Vice President here at Fisher Investments. I'm joined today by Senior Vice President of Research and Investment Policy Committee member, Michael Hansen. Hello, Jessica. Today's webinar addresses the exceptional volatility that markets are experiencing as the world responds to COVID-19. We will explore how Fisher Investments is analyzing the current pandemic, how we assess its potential long-term market impact, and what actions we may or may not take as a result. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to Senior Vice President of Research and Investment Policy Committee member, Michael Hansen, to get things started. I'm just going to give about a two-minute summary or so of what we plan to say today, um, so that way you don't have to wait 45 minutes for the punchline before we even get to Q&A or the rest of the presentation. And I would say it goes uh, about like this. This market has been unprecedented in a variety of ways. Uh, we were at all-time highs just a month ago, approximately, and now uh, we find ourselves in this moment. The market has behaved, though it seems and feels so different than anything else that's ever happened. In fact, the market behavior has behaved very much like certain types of very large corrections have. This one, of course, has been bigger and larger, but a lot of the characteristics of it have been similar. I'm going to explain to you in this uh, presentation our ways of thinking about that. I think that at this point, it's absolutely fair to call this a bear market, but one of the things that we need to keep our eyes on the most is not just magnitude, because what will be eye-popping and what everyone will focus on is magnitude, but in fact, it's the duration of these events that matter the most from here. And I'm going to say a lot about duration um, over the coming uh, hour or so. Our point of view is that We'll, t we'll tell you about what we think about the virus and how it's spread and, and all of that. Some of that you might agree with and some of it you, you may not. We're also going to talk a lot, though, about the response to the virus. And this is another key area where there's going to be a huge amount of emotion and disagreement. But it is our view that the response to the virus is, in fact, the thing that could create the economic uh, malaise, recession, whatever might be in the fore. I don't think recession is necessarily a foregone conclusion, as most do, but I think it's certainly on the table, and it's certainly possible. We'll talk through all of that. But regardless of your feelings on how uh, the reaction has been, both by the government, uh, on the government level and on the institutional level, they are what they are. These things are happening, and we need to analyze them, and that's what I'm going to be focused on today. So far, this fall has had all the characteristics of a classic correction. And when I say correction, here's the distinction that I mean. In full form, traditional bear markets, at least as we have observed them all over the course of history, they tend to have rolling tops followed by capitulation towards the end. Most of them have recession ensuing and so forth. Corrections, on the other hand, are steep, sharp drops that tend to dissipate and, and correct themselves with about the same speed as the fall. Now, despite this being such a breathtaking fall, in fact, most of the characteristics of this fit the definition of a correction versus a bear, but I think it, in magnitude alone, most will call this a bear, and I think that's fair to do. But I go back to the duration question. Bear markets have long duration. That's one of the really key features about them. They tend to last 15 to 18 months on average. That being the case, and seeing how much of negativity has already been priced into the market, in some ways, it's very hard to envision how, um, looking forward 12 months, we can't see a spring back in prices. And I'm going to enumerate the details and the reasoning for all of that. But whatever you want to call this, in the short term from here, I'm just going to tell you anything can happen. I mean, at this point, anything has happened in a lot of ways. And you should be emotionally prepared for that. If you think back to times in your past, which you can remember, times like 9-11, times like 2008, even if you go back to the fourth quarter of 2018, which was a very negative single quarter uh, for the market, you've seen this sort of thing before. You've actually felt this kind of emotion before, even though it seems unprecedented. I'm going to say much more about that. But as we look out ahead six, nine, 12 months into the future, we believe stock prices will eventually not only be higher, but significantly higher and correcting for what we believe has been certainly a very negative event, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that. There are negative things happening in the world today in real time, but it's a question of whether there's been an overreaction to that, what the reality will be, and so forth. And I'm going to say much more about it. 
Very importantly, and this is hallmark to all investing, it is not different today than it was before. There will be no all clear sign. There will not be a signal of any kind that tells you it's time for the market to go up. In fact, quite the opposite. The market moves ahead of things. And the market, in this case, moved well ahead and nearly instantaneous to a threat, in our view, that um, materialized very, very quickly. But there can be huge overreactions and so forth. The news will continue to look bad even as the market starts its consolidation and rallying process. And in fact, that can happen quickly. Right now, people are contemplating future bad news. As news becomes better than they expect in the future, which I believe to be the most likely outcome, shares can rise very quickly. And though that might seem impossible today, I understand the feeling entirely, how impossible that feels. See if you can remember back to times in the past where you felt similarly and yet People go on, markets go on, economies go on. One of the things that we've said um, several times now in the last few years is that the swiftness of, the, of some of the corrections recently, and now this episode can, in, inclusive of that, is that there's been relatively low liquidity in the market. What does that mean? Well, liquidity is a very important feature in stock markets. I personally believe it to be one of the most important features of stock markets because unlike other assets like homes and so forth, or even bonds, which can be more difficult to trade, stocks you can trade in real time, you can trade them daily and so forth. People trade them by the millions and millions of shares each day. When liquidity is lessened, when there's just less trading shares available, which is the way I'm going to define this today, although that's a crude definition, then the same amount of money moving through the market actually accentuates or emphasizes the market moves. And in a world where people look to the stock market as an indicator, as often they well should, in fact, recently, these moves continue to be emphasized, in our view, by the lack of liquidity, which just makes these moves bigger. They make them seem larger, and I think has been contributing to uh, the negative volatility and the negative sentiment. Let me now tell you about what our plan is going forward. We've seen the swiftest drop in market history by any way you look at it. You can compare any time in history. This has been the swiftest drop we've ever seen. That doesn't mean the market doesn't continue to behave as it normally does in terms of pricing and information and looking towards the future. Here are three paths that this code could go down. The first path is that, in fact, Markets have already priced in an extreme amount of negativity, perhaps even more that's, than, than is warranted, which I, I think is a fairly likely outcome. And that while the virus will take its toll, it will in fact dissipate itself the way that many other types of viruses of this sort eventually do. It will have a toll. It will have a negative toll. I don't want to mitigate that feature. But as flu se season uh, uh, rests itself as we get into the spring and summer months, there is a very good chance that we will see a peaking of, of viral outbreaks and a cessation of that over time. I'm going to say a lot more about that. If we get a situation or an outcome like that, which we believe to be the most likely, in fact, the market likely doesn't stay in bear market territory for very long, and the snapback can be swift. Will it be as swift as what we've just seen on the way down? Potentially. But it doesn't have to be. It could recover over some several months versus just recovering in one month. Any of those scenarios are fine with us, and we think it's OK. Second idea, if governmental and institutional shutdowns, required shutdowns of private enterprises continue on for more than, let's call it, two months or so, but that's just a number I'm pulling out, I'm pulling out here, it could be six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, whatever. As long as it's a time frame like that, what we, what we believe is that the economy, the global economy, will experience most likely a shallow recession. It might get away from recession, but it probably won't. We're likely to experience a recession. If it's shallow and it doesn't go on too much longer than, let's call it, three plus months, then the economy can write itself still pretty well, but we're likely to have a recession, and that might mean the birth of a new bull market. So far, we have not seen that take place. Everything we've seen, for the most part, points to this being a, a huge correction in the traditional sense of that word, uh, particularly as, it's, as it is sentiment-based. But we are looking at that second outcome. The third outcome, and this is the one that can be dangerous, it is not impossible, in our view, 
to contemplate a scenario where much of the world is on lockdown for better than three to six months. If that is the case, I unfortunately have um, bad news, which is that we are likely to experience a deep recession and a continued bear market along with that. But I want to emphasize, we believe by far the most likely outcome is that before the summer is over, both the economy and the markets have largely righted themselves, and we are largely getting on with things as we would. So I'm going to move on now from the portfolio ideas to talk about the actual coronavirus for a moment. Now, as I do this, I'm going to give you a summary and a few observations. As I've said about all this, first of all, we are not doctors here at Fisher Investments, and we're not going to try to tell you what you ought to think about this. That is not our job, and I don't plan to do so. What we are going to do is try to provide some context for you about things that we see. You think about that what you will. Um, but the truth is, for as long as we've been doing this, we've been in the business of seeking right information. That's effectively what investing and research is all about. Right information that is useful and better than what others take action on. The working assumption, and this is pretty well known at this point, is that COVID-19 is a highly contagious disease. Around half the population will ultimately be exposed, most likely, much like a common cold or flu. But, and this is according to current tallies and it seems to be persistent, the mortality rate is in fact higher than the common cold or flu. So we have high contagion and an elevated mortality rate. But what I'm gonna tell you about uh, very soon is that mortality rates, while they are elevated, they are nothing like certain other types of viruses we've seen in the past, and I think it's a very key difference. There is some evidence COVID-19 thrives in cooler temperatures and therefore may recess as the spring comes, or, or may, perhaps it won't. We don't know that. No one knows that. It's possible that the virus could migrate south into other countries as they experience their winter uh, upcoming. All of those things are possible and things to watch for. One of the most insidious parts of this, as I know many of you are aware and is very relevant to you, is that this affects the immunosuppressed and also on the elderly. And so that's something to be careful of and take very seriously. Where things get interesting anytime you're trying to analyze a phenomenon such as this is that what researchers and experts will tell you is that there are power laws at play or exponential laws at play, which is to say, while the cases may not look high today, they can double and quadruple by power laws uh, very quickly. And within, a kit's, within the set of a few days, you can have a much different situation. Those things are indeed true, but there is some reality to it and some non-reality to it because we do have some data behind some things that will happen. What I do want to, to prepare you for emotionally is that as the days go on, the numbers of those who are infected, positive cases, and the, and the numbers of deaths will, of course, go up. And what the market is doing is pre-pricing what it thinks it's going to happen. And very often in the short term, as you know, it can overshoot both to the upside and the downside. But that seems to be what's taking place. And it's a very difficult thing to ascertain. And every, as I said, everyone has their opinions about it. But I'd like to give you some context as well. I know this is a morbid topic. I don't particularly love talking about it either. But nearly 60 million people die annually. And those are numbers just for the US. If you, um, or, or I should say, that's a global number. Now, if you scale coronaviruses versus other illnesses, including the flu and non-respiratory, um, 2.8 million people die annually in the US, which is about 7,200 7, a day, which is a morbid thing to think about. But I want you to at least think of that number in your mind as you start to compare some of the tallies that you see, especially in areas that have already seen high infection rates and seen that crest, especially in places like Asia, South Korea, China, Japan, and so forth. I'd like to talk just in a comparative way about swine flu and coronavirus, if I may. It's an interesting comparison, and I'm not making this comparison to say they are sa the same. I'm, in fact, uh, making this comparison to highlight how they are different. So if you look at swine flu, which happened about 10 years ago, uh, 1.6 billion global cases, global deaths, 284,000. In the US, 60, nearly 61 million people uh, were infected and 13,000 deaths. 
The pandemic was declared ended in August 2010. And this is the part that I think is going to get very important about our analysis. Past situations that have been similar but could be different, we have not had the same level of response on almost any level. In August 2010, swine flu was a topic in the media. It was a topic of headlines. People were surely concerned, but we haven't had any of the response we've had this time, including shutdowns of public facilities, schools, private institutions, and so forth. That is a key difference and one that I'm going to continue to come back to as we try to understand what's happening uh, in this situation. I mentioned before the mortality rate, and what I have here uh, on slide number eight is just a look at it. Now, I'm going to warn you as well that these numbers are happening in real time. They're based on positive cases. They're based on a lot of data that will, in fact, change. But we can give an approximation. It gets us in the right territory. And as I mentioned before, the mortality rate for coronavirus is certainly higher than the flu or the cold. But it is not of a piece with SARS, MERS, Ebola, avian flu, and so forth. And again, I'm not making a statement about whether that's good or bad or how it plays out. I just want you to see that for context. I do also want to make a point about the flu season. And I don't want to um, make this point too much because it's not worth necessarily resting all of your laurels on it or all of your ideas on it. But it is the case, and it, it's very much worth noting, that we are about to end the season where the most contagious diseases that are commonly passed uh, in fact ends. And we're cresting at that. And as we move into March and April and into the spring and summer, um, it's very likely that just the overall incidence of infections of basic things like influenza, and that will include most likely the coronavirus, although you don't know that for sure, uh, that you will just see a natural cessation of this, at least over the summer months. And what that brings then is a question of, well, what happens from there? Um, do you have a reinfection rate and so forth? There is little evidence of those things happening. I will also tell you uh, in a few minutes about our views or just some optimistic notes about how quickly things like vaccines and so forth are happening in, in case uh, something like coronavirus does return again, let's say next year. But I'm going to hold that for, for just a moment. If you look at some hard data, and we're going to have a lot more of this for you over the, over the days and weeks to come, one of the best ways we've been able to see about how you actually track coronavirus is you don't really want to look at the number of cases, positive cases, as much. You can. It's a fine thing to look at. But the problem is it's so various. Uh, countries differ how they do uh, testing and how much of it they do. There are lots of false positives. There are lots of false negatives. There are some places that have self-reporting. There are some places that need actual positive tests, so on and so forth. But one thing that is really hard to deny is actual deaths per capita. And if you look at um, mortality rate per capita in the places where this has really happened, inclusive of places like Japan, South Korea, China, but also starting to be true in places like Iran and Italy and Europe, that the mortality rate, the actual death per capita, has been lower than the statistics suggest. Will that su persist? I'm not going to make a comment on that. I just want to put that out there as a comment. Uh, it's for you to decide. Johns Hopkins, in fact, suggests that the coronavirus has killed more than 2,700 people around the world in the prior four days. But compare that. In the same four days, roughly 600,000 people in the world will be killed by other things. That's 600,000. That's a scaling idea. One thing you know about us at Fisher Investments is regardless of the issue, we try to scale things appropriately. I said before, 60-odd million people die each year globally. Coronavirus will take its place in this, but if we scale things appropriately at its current trajectory, even by some of the worst estimates, it's going to be a bad thing with people that die but it will not be such a spike relative to the normal mortality rate of the human population. That's just something that seems to be emerging very quickly. But I do want to talk about one last topic um, having to do with the virus, which is this idea of flattening the curve. You may have heard this before. Uh, it's an idea that's been popularized now uh, over the course of the last two weeks just about everywhere. Well, what flattening the curve means is there's an effort to do things like social distancing or home quarantine or whatever it might be, such that it doesn't stop the infection rate, but it slows the infection rate. This is a very key difference, because one of the places where I've seen people fear things the most 
is that a lot of these ep efforts that are being implemented around the world, let alone the country, people are interpreting them as if the idea is to stop mortality around everywhere. That's not really the case. What flattening the curve wants to do is to slow the infection rate down so as to leave healthcare resources more open in case there's a giant flood all at once, you want to try and spread that out a little bit. What flattening the curve has never been about is actually stopping the infection rate because the numbers that we're quoting to you, the things we've said are consistent with the way the CDC looks at this, with all sorts of medical experts who are working in real time on this are working with this. And the simple fact is they're simply trying to slow things. They're not trying to stop things. That's a really important distinction, and I think it's very, uh, it's very much worth considering at the moment. I want to just read to you now one expert, uh, uh, excerpt from the New England Journal of Medicine that was published on March 12th, so just recently, by a fellow named David S. Jones. And the name of the, the article is History in a Crisis, the Lessons for COVID-19. And again, I want you to think of this as context. I don't want you to necessarily think that you have to agree with this. But here's what he says, among other things. History suggests that we are actually at a much greater risk of exaggerated fears and misplaced priorities. There are many historical examples of panic about epidemics that have never materialized. For example, H1N1 influenza in 1976, 2006, and 2009. There are countless other examples of societies worrying about a relatively small threat, such as the risk of Ebola, while ignoring much larger ones hidden in plain sight. COVID-19, others, including SARS, had killed roughly 5,000 people by March, uh, March 12th. And this, I'm speaking specifically of COVID-19 right now. 5,000 people feels like a big number. But in fact, what Dr. Jones says is that a fraction of influences, that's a fraction of influenza's annual toll. While the COVID-19 epidemic has unfolded, China has probably lost 5,000 people each day to things like heart disease. So for example, why do so many Americans refuse influenza vaccines? Or why did China shut down its economy to contain the virus while doing little to curb cigarette use? Societies and their citizens misunderstand the relative importance of the health risks they face. The future course of COVID-19 remains unclear. And Dr. Jones, in fact, says, I may rue these words one day. But nevertheless, he says, citizens and their leaders need to think carefully, weigh risks in context, and pursue policies commensurate with the magnitude of the threat. Again, I, I, I put that to you for consideration. And next, I'll put to you an idea that has some optimism to it, because I just don't think we have enough optimistic thinking at the moment to countervail. There's something called the Peltzman effect. And Ken, in fact, you will hear him tout this. And what it means is effectively that people adjust their behavior tied to the perceived level of risk. And <clears throat> when perceived level of risk is very high, funny things start to happen. There are key situations where second order effects or unintended consequences happen. Uh, it might be interesting to you to know, for example, currently Japan is trending at about half its normal influenza infection rate almost certainly because of the measures taken to protect against COVID-19. And so, and I know this might sound crazy, but I want you to contemplate it. It's not impossible because of second order effects for people being so cautious about this, that in fact we see overall influenza deaths be less this year than widely anticipated, which in fact might be a larger effect than anything COVID-19 in fact does. I just want you to consider it. These are the types of things that we're thinking about. Now, for a moment, though, I'd just like to tell you some real things that are happening, because while it's not going to be a perfect analogy, I do want to just share with you a little bit about what's happened so far in China. First, what you have on your screen <clears throat> are the active coronavirus cases in China, and you can see the curve. For a period of time there, it looks pretty scary, but it does flatten and it does uh, come down. One re very interesting feature and something we are keeping an exceptionally close eye on is that this has been true with China. We'll see if it's true elsewhere. When China's active cases peaked and started to fall, their market started to outperform markedly in the last several weeks. Will that repeat itself across the world? It very well could. We're going to watch it very closely. 
But nevertheless, I think the thing that's most important is China's experience with this, <clears throat> and again, we can debate about how that went, the differences in the countries, and all the different methods. But the simple reality is China is about 98% back, back online. And I, I would like to point out to you that 90% of companies with revenue greater than 200 million in yuan are back up and running. And there's verification of this all across, um, all across the world, including journalists, not just folks in China and so forth. <clears throat> it's a real effect. It's something that seems to have last for, lasted for several months, and it had a, a real effect on the economy. I mean, you, there is negative numbers in China today. And I think it's a very good lesson because what I mentioned to you before is that the market will move up faster and above um, news getting better. Well, China's negative economic news is just now coming out, and yet their stock market has rebounded faster, at least relative to the rest of the world. Okay, next I want to turn my attention for a few minutes on what the response has been, because I've spoken so much about what the response is and, and how that matters most, so let's talk about it. What's on your screen is a rundown of recent stimulus measures, and this is real-time information. There's actually even more of it now as of this morning, and we'll update this chart as well. But I hope you can just get a sense at the huge wall of fiscal and monetary stimulus that is about to hit the economies of the world. Now, before we get excited about that, we at Fisher Investments have never believed that you need some new government program to come in and, and quote unquote save the economy or the market, that those things do have the ability to right themselves. They have in the past. There's really no reason this would be different in a variety of ways, although I admit to you that this situation is exceptional. But nevertheless, and, and I think the irony of all this is that most of these stimulus measures will in fact start hitting the economy after it has started to recover. And so what tends to happen in these situations is it doesn't really help the bad part, but as the good part starts, it supercharges it a little bit. Will all of this money be spent wisely? Of course not, <clears throat> but some of it will. And it will be a tailwind for the economy as it hits. And the point that I think is really worth making the most now is that we're not talking about small potatoes anymore. Um, economies, as of the last 48 hours, have really, global economies, but specifically the U.S. and others, are really talking about big stimulus measures in relationship to their GDP. Again, they'll take time. They won't be as effective as people think. And we wish most of it were not necessary at all, but nevertheless, that's going to happen. It's worth noting, though, that every, just about every time uh, the Fed tries to do something, the central banks try to do something, that, in fact, the market falls more. Because in a certain um, odd way, people tend to interpret emergency actions as a bad thing because they say to themselves, well, what do those people know that others don't? And the answer to that is they probably don't know much. They're probably reacting in the same way so many others are. Um, there's not there's not so much special privileged information in those realms that tell that, that they know exactly what happens from here. They're people just like we are trying to make difficult decisions. So with that context, <clears throat> this is the part that I believe really matters the most to what happens with the market and what happens with the economy. I said this as we were com uh, comparing swine flu and coronavirus. The difference between past episodes such as these and the one we see now has been the response from governments and private institutions closing much of the service-based economy in a mass sense. It's an exceptionally bad thing. And here's what the important sort of pivot point is. And when I say a bad thing, I'm not saying it's not necessarily warranted. You might have an opinion on that. You might think it's the right thing to do. My statement is, Regardless of whether you think it's the right thing to do, it has a significant negative economic consequence. That's what the capital markets are reacting to. In situations like this, which we don't know a lot about because there's not very much evidence of having widespread economic shutdowns uh, over the course of global economies, you can make a few statements. And this is, again, what I believe is most important. If it lasts for a few weeks and maybe even just a few months, the economy can largely right itself and come back online. In that situation, we probably have maybe not a recession at all, or maybe a shallow recession globally. Most people will be able to go back to work as they did before, and life can, will be changed without a doubt, because I think this has certainly taken an emotional toll on everyone, but largely things will be similar. If, however, such a shutdown persists for many months, and 
I can't give you a firm number. I, you, you, just, you just can't think about that right now. There's too much to extrapolate. But if it lasts longer than, let's say, a quarter, I'm just going to put that number out there. If it lasts longer than a quarter, then things get bad quickly. And the reason for that is an economy can withstand some dislocation in the short term. But if you have to shutter a lot of operations for, let's say, three months, six months, something like that, then a lot of those companies that could tread water for a little while, in fact, no longer tread water, and they'll have to shutter. That's where you get a true recession, a deep recession, and you have to get a new bull market and new expansion out of that because people can't just go back to work the same way they did. A lot of organizations won't exist anymore, so instead you have to build something new. Now, I don't want to paint too dire a picture here. I don't want to make that sound too dire, but we want to contemplate those things. It's important. We do believe that's a low likelihood that almost overwhelmingly certain, I shouldn't say certain at all, that's not true, but in our view, it's likely, very likely, that this persists for well less than three months, but we'll have to monitor the situation, and it's something that's very fluid. Some narrow industries are going to be hurt, and you need to be able to watch for that and see it without too much emotion. In times like these, certain small sectors and industries, in particular some of the smaller energy companies in the United States that <clears throat> are low-margin producers of oil, they're going to be hurt. They're going to be hurt along with oil prices and so forth. That doesn't necessarily mean the entire system is, is cracking, but in such situations, certain industries can be hurt more than others. We want you to expect you to see that. One last part on the stimulus and about the system in general, because in the last several weeks, we've had a few haltings of trades, uh, of trading activity, and all sorts of other systemic market measures spoken about by the Fed, things that were brought out in 2008 for the crisis then are being brought out now. What does all of that mean? Well, <clears throat> surely some of it will help uh, to keep some institutions and other places solvent and uh, in place through this time. But for the most part, and we've said this now for some years, the very big banks of the world are in fact very well capitalized. And for this situation, they are in an okay position, much better than they have been really for many years. And with the additional provisions of lifting of certain uh, capital buffers that they have to keep from the Fed or other liquidity provisions, they really are at this moment in very good shape systemically. I'm going to tell you something else, though, that's a little pessimistic. That will be true, almost certainly, in the short run. If this continues to persist for many months, systemic problems can once again reemerge themselves. And in fact, central banks can't necessarily fix everything. And so this, again, is where I come back to the idea. It's not about magnitude. It's about duration. This is all about duration, whether it's the market or the economy today. I've put on your screen uh, times to vaccine, and you can see that the coronavirus there, it's becoming now two months to the first human study for vaccines. Does that mean we'll have one in the next several months? No, it doesn't. There's still a lot that has to be done, but I mentioned before, it's likely that if you do have a respread of coronavirus, let's say a year from now, there is very likely to be antivirals, if not an outright vaccine. It's, it's, it certainly is possible. But I want to get broader than that. As you look for news and things to be optimistic about over the course of the next days, one of the things that I hope you consider is that the economy will come back online, but it won't do so all at once. It'll probably happen in waves. For example, businesses such as Fisher Investments, we continue to take not only our client uh, health and financial health of the utmost seriousness, but also the health of our employees. So we've instituted measures to be safe while continuing to provide the absolute best service that's possible. Companies are all over the world are going to start doing that. And it's not going to be in any headlines. What you're going to see is slowly, after some weeks, 50% capacity, 75% capacity. The next thing you know that what's regarded as major businesses and services, not just critical ones, are largely back online. What my best guess is, is that in fact public institutions and especially schools will be some of the last to come online. But my point to you is that don't expect an all clear signal. This will happen in waves and some of it will sneak up on people. They won't see how much activity has really come back after um, likely just a few weeks or a month. I'm going to make this statement because I think it's important for our client base and this is per the CDC. 
there is an increase in risk to older adults, um, especially, and, and I think that's especially important because what the CDC says, and I believe this to be true, is that something like 40% of grandparents in the United States in the United States provide child care for their grandchildren. And I want to say that just in the sense that please be careful, please understand what you're doing if you are in an at-risk category. We want you to take that very seriously. But beyond that, and especially those of you who have seen some of these things in the past, I really want you to think back of the times you felt the worst in your life about society and, and how civilization is going. And, and I hate to do that to you, but I want to do it to you. Communities all over the world and for as long as we've had civilization have learned to live with existential threat. We have lived through natural disasters of all kinds. Um, generations have lived with the threat of nuclear war. 9-11 brought tremendous hysteria, threats of anthrax, etc., for a period of weeks. There's been measles, smallpox, SARS, and all the rest. Maybe this one is different. It could be, but I do not, but I believe truly that human communities come together very well against a common enemy, and this is a common enemy, and it's one, in fact, that can be uh, defeated. Markets will learn how to live with viruses, too. What my belief is is that we're about to see a very real form uh, mass adaptation, perhaps at scale larger than we've ever seen the human community do. There's going to be trillions of dollars thrown at mass sanitation and other measures to, to, fix, to uh, improve public welfare. <clears throat> right now, there are probably thousands of kids who are probably not even in college classes right now thinking about how they can make some kind of application so that you can test yourself in real time and get all sorts of new data. There's all sorts of new good things coming for society, and those are just a couple of examples. I also want you to notice just how well things like infrastructure have held up in the last several weeks. Uh, with effectively half the world at home or, not, or more, internet infrastructure has worked remarkably well. And I think that's something that's really worth saying because perhaps 10 years ago it may not have been the same. Think about companies and their social value like Walmart and Amazon and how their impressive, amazing, world-class distribution systems are now going to help millions of people as they have to stay at home for a while. You may have seen the headline of Amazon hiring effective immediately 100,000 people in order to fill demand. I'd like to just say one small personal note as well uh, because I do believe it's relevant. When I started my career, I was an investment banker at the infamous Bear Stearns during the tech boom of 1999 and 2000. When 9-11 happened, I lost my job just week at, weeks after. I was a kid with no money, nothing to do, and I was very scared. I remember that with tremendous emotional re uh, resonance. It's actually how I came to a place called Fisher Investments. But in that time, airlines were desperate and closed and talking about going bankrupt. People believed any rumor. Mass hysteria was real. You know that, you felt it before, you know you felt it before, and you know that we as a people weather those things. What's really happening in my mind, especially as you look at some things like people going and buying toilet paper and all that sort of thing, some of that is true panic, I'm not going to deny that. But for the most part, most people are acting really quite rationally. And just think of it this way. If you had the prospect of being at home for four weeks or eight weeks, whatever it's going to be, and especially if you had the prospect of your kids coming home from college, you too are very likely to go to the store and buy some more milk and eggs. Uh, I think that what the world just did was brought forward four to six weeks of basic consumption. You should be impressed by that because the system has worked remarkably well. You should also be impressed by the <clears throat> distribution chains are such that if there's been scarcity, it's only lasted a few hours because companies like Costco, Amazon, Walmart actually have 24-hour distribution systems. And very importantly, and I do want you to hear this, there is no scarcity problem. This problem is not a problem of supply. It is a problem of demand. And it's likely in my mind, although this is just a speculation, that as we look forward, there's likely to be a huge overabundance of supply of basic goods because as companies react to so much purchasing right now, we may see shelves very much lined uh, into the future. Because as again, 
This is not a supply problem. This is a demand problem. And if we do have a recession, it will be because of a sudden drop in lack of demand. I said this before, but one of the most insidious parts of this event is that it hits services right square in the middle. And if you've been a client of ours for uh, any period of time, you know that we've told you services is by far the biggest part of the economy. That's a bad thing. I'm not asking you to be optimistic. <clears throat> Everyone has their views about this. What I'm asking you to do is challenge the assumption of a truly gloomy outlook and to see just months from now a potentially much brighter future ahead for yourselves and the entire human community. It is my true belief that cheerfulness in a crisis is a sign of character and a little bit of courage goes a very long way both for your wealth and for the good of us all. Take care of each other uh, as we will do our best to take care of you and thank you for allowing us to be a part of that solution. We will be by your side through all of it. Thank you.